Tonight, Iran and Israel appear to step back from the brink. Maybe the tit for tat for now has ended. An apparent Israeli attack in Iran overnight is much more limited than fear, where it leaves the bitter rivals and fears of a wider war. A landmark ruling in B.C. awards shared custody of a dog. They are my kids, and I will fight tooth and nail for them. The move to recognize pets as more than property. And for a fortnight there, we were forever running to you so... Taylor Swift drops two new albums in a single night. Album! Yeah! Thrilling fans and breaking records. From CBC News, this is The National with Ian Hennemansing. And we begin tonight with breaking news. Fire is tearing through part of the Labrador town of Happy Valley Goose Bay. A state of emergency has been declared. The fire has consumed buildings and is threatening dozens of homes. Some explosions have been heard and there's an evacuation order for the immediate area. That includes several streets in the north part of the community, which also contains an animal shelter. The CBC's Heidi Atter joins us from Happy Valley Goose Bay. Heidi, you've been at the scene and describe for us what you've seen and heard. So right now, this hour, the explosions seem to be getting smaller with pops instead of loud bangs being heard from the fire and the hangar. About two dozen people have been evacuated so far, as you mentioned, in that animal shelter. Volunteers worked very quickly to try and get all of the animals out of harm's way as quickly as possible. Now, there have been multiple ambulances headed to the scene in the past few hours, but there's no word on injuries just yet as RCMP and search and rescue have a large perimeter set up all around the scene and uh, they're working on this with a number of volunteers and volunteer firefighters but at this point the fire is still out of control. Our audience is looking at that video of uh, an air traffic control tower on fire so describe for them the air force base and and what that tower is. So this tower that we're looking at here is a piece of local history. When the base was first built, this was one of the first towers in the late 40s, early 50s. But of course, that means building standards were very different back in those days when the base was starting up. So this tower quickly went up in flames and it's the hangar right beside it that has people especially concerned. Now, these are this is where small and large oxygen storage tanks were at the location. So at this point, it's a waiting game to see if more of those oxygen tanks are going to burst or if we might be uh, slowly starting to get out of the woods here. All right. You've done a nice job of watching this story through the night and into the early morning and will continue to do that for us. CBC's Heidi Adder in Happy Valley, Goose Bay. All right, uh, to the Middle East now where there is relief but also uncertainty after the second unprecedented attack this week. U.S. news organizations citing unnamed government officials say Israel hit Iran directly for the first time. An apparent response to Iran's direct missile and drone attack on Israel on Saturday. Here's what we know. Around 4 a.m. local time, Iran closed much of its airspace. Reports of explosions in Syria and in Iran's province of Isfahan followed. U.S. news organizations cited officials saying this was an Israeli attack, but what was hit, if anything, not clear. Isfahan has several military sites, including an air base, but Iranian officials said air defenses engaged just a few small drones and destroyed them. The apparent retaliation much more muted than so many in the region had feared. And as Chris Brown explains, the hope is that what follows now is relative calm. The booms in the pre-dawn sky near the Iranian city of Isfahan signaled air defenses had identified an incoming attack. But it all appeared to be over quickly, and at Iran's high-value nuclear sites nearby, amateur video was posted soon after showing that everything appeared fine and secure. That messaging was repeated on state television, reporting that the intruders were shot down, no damage done. Other than that, nothing has happened. Israel has not commented on the attack, but if that was Israel's response, it represented a tiny fraction of the firepower Iran unleashed on Israel less than a week earlier. More than 300 projectiles were almost all shot down 
thanks to the combined efforts of Israel, the United States, Britain and other countries. In Jerusalem, some said they were disappointed by the Israeli move. I expected more, to be quite honest. I think more would have been even justified considering they sent 300 rockets to kill so many people. Maybe the tit for tat for now has ended. This former Israeli military officer who was once in charge of gathering intelligence on Iran says the incident has left Israel facing an emboldened Iran and a tougher security environment. Israel will find it very hard to cope with the Iranian access alone. And I think we need our partners. And in order to do so, Israel have to move in other directions, for example, regarding the Palestinian issue, in a way that it will ease the Gulf state, especially Saudi Arabia, uh, to have normalization. In all likelihood, Israel's focus will now swing back to Gaza, where its offensive has killed more than 34,000 and displaced 1.6 million people. Many there wonder if Israel quieted things with Iran so as to open a new phase of the war against Hamas in crowded Rafah. Will Israel come from the ocean, from the east or the west or by planes? No one knows anything, said Abu Jabbar al-Arja. We have an indescribable fear. What are we waiting for? Chris Summers suggesting this attack on Iran by Israel was more about sending a, a political message of de-escalation rather than actually trying to cause damage. Yes, but of course, these two adversaries have many ways they can fight each other. There are near daily firefights in Israel's northern border with Lebanon between Israel's army and Hezbollah, which is Iran's largest proxy army. And those exchanges are not likely to stop. So while both sides may have taken a step back here, their struggle for dominance continues. And the fear is this pause could just be temporary. Ian. Chris Brown in Jerusalem. Officially, the Biden administration's reaction to the strike on Iran is a firm and repeated no comment. I'm not going to speak to that, except to say that the United States has not been involved in any offensive operations. Again, I'm not going to speak to anything other than to say we were not involved. Again, I'm, uh, I'm not going to, uh, to speak to these reported events. So far, the only confirmation that Israel was even behind the attack has come from U.S. news outlets citing confidential government sources. A man wearing what appeared to be an explosive vest allegedly threatened the Iranian consulate in Paris. Police cordoning off the area for hours. They were able to arrest the man without incident. He had no weapons. That explosive vest turned out to be fake. Officials say he'd been convicted for setting a fire at the Iranian embassy complex last year. The Canadian food aid worker killed in Gaza earlier this month was mourned at a funeral in Quebec today. Survived by his wife and infant son, Jacob Flickinger was one of seven World Central Kitchen workers killed by an Israeli airstrike on April 1st while distributing food in central Gaza. The incident triggered international outrage. Israel maintains it was a tragic mistake. A shocking act of protest today outside the New York City courthouse where Donald Trump's criminal trial is taking place. A man lit himself on fire. Chris Reyes now on the disturbing scene and the court proceedings inside ahead of opening arguments on Monday. The jury selection process for Donald Trump's hush money trial was exhaustive and combative. At every step, both sides raised concerns about bias. That it finished in one week was a surprise to some and a point of contention for Trump. The judge wants us to go as fast as possible. That's for his reasons, not for my reasons. And this is really a concerted witch hunt, very simple. The speed at which 12 jurors and six backups were chosen from a pool of hundreds speaks to the reputation of Justice Juan Mershon, a veteran judge known for running his courtrooms like a tight ship. He powered through a series of lawyers' objections and requests, even an added hearing to determine what Trump can and cannot be asked on the stand about his previous legal cases. Trump's defense team also made one last attempt to have the trial moved out of Manhattan again. It was denied. In court, Mershon put his foot down. There's nothing else to argue, he said. We're going to have opening statements on Monday. And just as details were finalized, 
A horrific act took place just across the street from the courthouse. A man threw pamphlets in the air and set himself on fire in a park where pro and anti-Trump demonstrators have been gathering all week. It seemed to be propaganda based, uh, almost like a conspiracy theory type of uh, pamphlet. That man is now in critical condition. Police are investigating his background and possible motivations. And Chris, you were outside the courthouse when this happened. That's right, it happened right behind where we're standing. And Ian, it was shocking and scary to witness that incident. I think it was a reminder that no matter how much security there is here, there's just no way that law enforcement can anticipate every single threat, especially for a case like this one that attracts so much attention. We're told they're gonna to be reviewing their security protocols this weekend. But remember, the challenge is that we're in downtown Manhattan, densely packed, and many of the areas around the courthouse are still open to the public. Chris Reyes in New York City. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau is out selling the federal budget. Today, speaking with students in Victoria about the $4.6 billion towards education and research. We need to attract, develop, and retain Canada's top research talent, and this is exactly what these measures will do. Half of the proposed funding will go towards post-secondary scholarships, research grant funding and fellowships. The appearance was Trudeau's first since the budget was unveiled on Tuesday. A warning tonight from a group of Canadian cancer doctors. They say lives are at risk because family physicians are using outdated cancer screening guidelines. As Marina von Stackelberg shows us, experts want the national standard rebuilt. Carolyn Holland often wonders how life would be different if she'd gotten a mammogram. Diagnosed with breast cancer at 43, Canada's guidelines recommended against one. Had I been able to access screening at 40, this wouldn't have been my outcome. By the time she found the lump, the cancer was advanced, requiring aggressive chemo and a double mastectomy. This shouldn't be happening and this shouldn't happen to other women. A group of cancer experts say the national screening guidelines created by a task force of family doctors are up to a decade out of date. Some provinces have gone against them in creating their own screening programs. But unfortunately, um, a lot of family physicians are taught and trained to follow the task force guidelines. Family doctor Anna Wilkinson, who also treats cancer patients, says the national guideline on breast cancer relies on old research. One trial was 1963 that they're using to determine whether we screen women today. And that is completely irrelevant at this point. The guidelines lag behind other countries. For example, Canada's task force still recommends against screening for HPV and against a blood test for prostate cancer. I think they are harming Canadians because they are leading us to diagnose cancers at a later stage when we know survival is worse and when the costs of treatment are more. The task force says there is a risk in screening too much. It could prompt treatment that's more harmful than the cancer itself. The group does consult with cancer experts, but those experts don't set the guidelines. Someone who's been researching and advocating in the breast cancer or prostate cancer field for their whole career might have a different view than a, a neutral group that is trying to make recommendations for family doctors. You're not saving us from harms, you're putting us in harm's way by denying us screening. Carolyn Holland says patients like her deserve to know. Marina von Stackelberg, CBC News, Ottawa. Three people, two of them teenagers, are facing charges after a string of recent carjackings in the Toronto area. This video shows police boxing in a white Acura that police say was spotted at a number of the carjacking attempts. Three suspects then ran away before they were arrested. Police say one of them tossed a loaded gun. An 18-year-old, a 15-year-old, and a 16-year-old now facing multiple gun and property charges. Here in BC, a golden retriever named Stella has helped make legal history after a woman and her ex-boyfriend were ordered to share custody of the dog. As Tanya Fletcher explains, the ruling follows a new law that says pets are more than just property. They're family. Bother. Sahar Bayat is overjoyed to be reunited with her dog Stella after spending the last 10 months in legal limbo. It was a long process. It was very lengthy, very costly. 
She and her partner got Stella as a puppy in 2020. Last year, they split up. Vyat says her ex kept Stella because only his name was on the dog's certificate. Well, I couldn't bear the pain of not having her. She was a huge part of my life. I, I, we spent 24-7 together. She was so devastated, she wound up getting another dog, Lola, as the legal process unfolded. Their case ultimately became the first of its kind to go before the B.C. Supreme Court. Vyat hired lawyers, paid $60,000 in legal fees, and eventually the judge ordered joint custody. I'm very, very thankful for, for the new law because, you know, these days dogs are just like kids to everyone else. They are my kids and I will fight tooth and nail for them. The landmark decision comes three months after BC updated its Family Law Act, now recognizing pets not as property but as members of the family. Before it was simply whoever owned the pet got to keep the pet. Now the courts will consider eight relational factors under the new legislation. We're seeing how the pet fits into the family setting. Is there a bond with the child? Uh, who really cared for the pet? Who picked up the poop? I mean, it's not as simplistic as, say, the ownership of a bicycle. Victoria Schroff is a lawyer who specializes in animal rights and was consulted by the province in making these changes. She says B.C. is the first to pass such legislation and other provinces have since approached her to help bring in similar laws. I'm really excited with the prospect of B.C. having set up a, a big precedent uh, in legislation for other provinces to follow potentially. Yes. As for Bayat, it was all worth it. It was all worth it. Honestly, I would do it all over again for her. Tanya Fletcher, CBC News, Surrey, B.C. To India now, where millions of people cast their votes today as the world's largest election kicked off its six-week process. The Prime Minister, Narendra Modi, is widely expected to secure a rare third term in office. As our South Asian correspondent, Salima Shivji, shows us, that's exactly what many voters want. The lines ebb and flow in India's north. For this, the first of seven phases of voting in the biggest election the world has ever seen. It's my duty to vote, Salma Dilshad says, or else nothing changes. One family arrived, 15 members strong, with a singular purpose. The Prime Minister Narendra Modi is the best, this matriarch says. He'll get a massive majority. Looking at the polls, few doubt that Modi will capture a rare third term. This polling station is in Uttar Pradesh, India's most populous state, with more people living here than in some countries like Brazil and Pakistan. It sends the most MPs to India's parliament, and it's right in the center of the country's Hindi heartland, where Narendra Modi is very popular. There's a frenzied devotion at many of his rallies. His supporters adore him. Modi, our God, has done very good work, he says. Especially, especially strong Hinduism. Hinduism, strong Hinduism. Modi's Hindu nationalist agenda resonates deeply, even as his critics charge he's targeting India's minorities and eroding its secular constitution. Modi also praises India's fast-growing economy, but some say it's a hollow message, with inequality deepening and unemployment high. That pain is felt here, where laborers wait desperately every morning to be hired for a casual day's work. What has the Modi government done for the poor? Nothing, this man says. Others fear further divisions. Hindu, 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 Hindu. All Modi has done is divide Hindus and Muslims, this young man says. That's how he works. But most see the opposition banded together in a fragmented alliance as facing an uphill battle in this election against a dominant, if polarizing, prime minister. Salima Shivji, CBC News, Muzaffar Uttar Pradesh. Almost a billion people are registered to vote in this general election. As you might imagine, that comes with some very challenging logistics. Salima will be back a little later in the show with that part of the story. As the Olympics draw closer, there's new talk about the potential role of artificial intelligence. If AI would have been used in 2004, in the vault competition, I think I would have won a bronze medal. Why the technology could take the guesswork out of judging. Plus. A double dose of Taylor Swift. How that surprise is already helping her break records. 
and a surfer looks to make history against an absolute mammoth of a wave. The ocean was very angry and very um, powerful. We're back in two. The flame that will burn throughout the 2024 Olympics has arrived at the Acropolis in Athens. It's part of the torch relay, marking the final stretch of preparations for the Summer Games. The tradition will culminate with the lighting of the Olympic flame at the opening ceremony in Paris this July. Artificial intelligence will play a key role in the Olympics. Organizers shared their new guidelines for the technology today. As Sam Sampson explains, it'll help with everything from tricky judging calls to scouting new talent from around the world. Imagine an instant replay of an Olympic dive looking like this. In the moment metrics of distance, degree, rotation. That's what's coming for Paris 2024. The International Olympic Committee rolled out an artificial intelligence plan for the games, including judging tools. AI will of course help to provide additional information to judges to score in a more informed way. Now this all has to be done in a way to protect the integrity of the athlete's results. Crucial. So important for him to nail this one. He Some athletes believe AI could eliminate judging errors or biases, like Kyle Schufelt. The Canadian won gold in 2004 on the floor and almost won bronze in the vault. But in a controversial decision, a judge gave an opponent who fell a higher score. If AI would have been used in 2004 in the vault competition, I think I would have won a bronze medal. Schufelt says AI will add fairness, but there still has to be some heart. I would be scared if at a competition, a bunch of like R2-D2s come rolling into the competition and those are your judges. I wouldn't trust that. But when you have a combination of humans and the robotics and the technology, I think that that is like a really nice balance. Ahead of the upcoming Youth Olympics, the IOC used AI to find new talent, future Olympians. It's a seed of encouragement possibly needed in modern times. With social media now and the way kids operate, you know, if they don't have some sort of instant knowledge, they move on really quickly. If AI helps them to acknowledge that their talent does exist, I think it's, a, it's hugely beneficial. While the IOC highlighted the potential benefits of AI, they were clear. He's got the gold medal! Artificial intelligence isn't meant to replace athletes. Gold for Canada! The humanity of the games will remain untouched. And she can't see it, now she can! Sam Sampson, CBC News, Regina. Taylor Swift is taking the world by storm yet again after a last minute twist during the release of her new album. A surprise double album that's doubling the excitement. Plus a closer look at Canada's new tax hike. A larger share of the population will at some point be affected. Who will pay now and who could pay in the years to come? How India is preparing for the biggest election in the world and the rules aimed at getting all voters to the polls. Meet the Indian man who gets his very own voting booth. The National breaks down the story shaping our world. Next. The NHL says it's committed to having a team back in Phoenix within the next five years if there's progress on building a new arena. The Coyotes played the last two seasons in a small rink on the Arizona State University campus. It's not fair to the players on the Coyotes. It's not fair to the players on the other teams that come in. It's not a major league facility. And the prospect of possibly playing playoff games there or a Stanley Cup final, it, it just didn't work. The sale and relocation of the Coyotes to Salt Lake City was approved yesterday. The former owner plans to bid on land for a new arena in Phoenix in June. That's the first step to potentially having a team back in the city. After months of speculation and anticipation, Taylor Swift's latest record is already breaking records. As popular as she is prolific, this is her 11th studio album. And as Ithil Musa shows us, Swifties are getting even more than they expected. Five, four, three, two, one. 
four, three. The countdown to midnight. Taylor Swift's highly anticipated new album, The Tortured Poets Department, dropped. Then, two hours later, to end surprise, the <laughs> Tortured Poets Another 15 tracks. All of this to say. Swift's new album is Spotify's most streamed in a single day so far this year. And no one here She's definitely, you know, one of the top selling vinyl artists for sure. She's reached a stature now that, you know, few, few pop stars get to. Super Swifty Chelsea Gibson says she had to have her own personal copy of the vinyl record. It makes it fun to have it in like by your hands. And Swift's latest songs tell like a vulnerable tale of heartbreak, giving fans a peek into the personal life the of a very public so performer. I think, so speaking as a woman, it's hard to get representation that is as diverse emotionally as she's covered. Swift was named Time Magazine's Person of the Year in 2023, a recognition of her influence on everything from pop culture to voter registration. The 34-year-old has released five albums in the last five years, plus re-recordings of her older work. And I'll write your name. And her era's tour drives an economic boost in every city it hits. This music journalist says with this latest album, Swift delivers music her fans have come to expect. And I think you see this real vulnerability, and of course that has been her hallmark over the years, but we also see Taylor Swift in present tense. So she's reflecting on the past, but there also are these really visceral responses to how she's experiencing her life today. And for a fortnight, Vincent says Swift's openness on her new album has made her even more relatable to fans, fostering a new level of devotion. Idil Moussa, CBC News, Toronto. Now it's time to dig deeper into the stories shaping our world. The scale of India's ongoing election is something to behold. Six weeks long, about a billion eligible voters. It is the biggest management event of any kind in the world. But first, with billions in new spending in this week's federal budget, how is the government proposing to pay for it? We're making Canada's tax system more fair by ensuring that the very wealthiest pay their fair share. So how might that affect you? Senior business reporter Nisha Patel is here to break it down for us. And Nisha, capital gains in the headlines, but a lot of people are wondering, what are they? Ian, millions of Canadians don't earn capital gains, so it's okay to be unfamiliar with the phrase. Let's say you own a rental property or shares in a company. If you sell that asset or investment for more than the original purchase price, it's called a capital gain. You made money and you'll have to pay tax on it. Changing how that money is taxed is a move that's been met with praise, criticism, and frankly, a lot of confusion. The new rules would take effect in just about 10 weeks, June 25th. Right now, corporations and trusts pay tax on half their profits. The changes announced in the budget would have that jump to two-thirds. Individuals would still pay tax on half the money they made, up to $250,000 a year but two-thirds would be taxable for every dollar above that level. Remember, it's not the actual tax rate that's changing. You just have to pay tax on a bigger slice of the pie. The federal government says this move makes the tax system more efficient because for people who work a job, all of their wage or salary is subject to tax, but for someone who plays the stock market, only half of that income is taxed right now, so the change is meant to reduce that advantage. And so a big question, what, what impact is this going to have on, on individuals? There are estimates that this will impact about 40,000 Canadians in any given year. Many of them are the highest earning in the country. But there are some average folks who could get caught up in this change. Here's economist Trevor Toome. In different years, different people will be affected. So a larger share of the population will at some point be affected by that, even though it's true that at any given year, it's less than 1% of tax filers. And yeah, where uh, more middle class uh, Canadians may be affected would be those who have second properties. While capital gains from selling a principal home still won't get taxed, anyone who owns an additional property like a cottage or a condo that they want to sell could get hit with a higher tax bill. Here's how the math works. 
Take someone in the top tax bracket living in Ontario who made $300,000 in profit from selling a second property. The new rules would cost them more than $4,400 in extra tax. That means there is the possibility, Ian, that selling before that June 25th deadline could save some money. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see if there's a spike in sales ahead of the deadline. Now, there's been pushback from, from business groups. What's their issue? You're right. Hundreds of CEOs have even signed an open letter asking the government to scrap this tax change. They say making companies pay more will squash business investment at a time when Canada is already facing a productivity crisis. And that higher taxes will force entrepreneurs to think twice about taking risks and trying to grow their business. The tech sector has been particularly vocal about these changes. Take a listen. Our goal should be to try and build globally successful giant firms that are headquartered here that generate tens of billions of dollars of revenue so that it spurs on hiring of, of, of people in the country that have ownership in these firms that then pay taxes and that generate wealth and prosperity. The way that this is being structured is it makes it punitive to the point where Individuals are questioning whether or not they should remain in this country, they should keep their companies in this country, and whether or not um, there is a future for, uh, for the space. Some economists say businesses that are concerned should be pushing for lower corporate tax rates. And the government did try to blunt the impact on entrepreneurs by giving some new tax breaks to small business owners. There are others who say the changes are fair. Here's Ali Asaria, a tech CEO who founded the website well.ca. Everything I'm hearing right now is people are saying it's harder to pay rent, it's harder to afford groceries. And so if we could all step back and talk about how do we make it easier to live in Canada so that we can all you know, invest in ourselves and invest in our companies, that's a more important question than how do we help the top 0.313% of Canadians make more money. So there is a diversity of opinion on this, Nisha. Taking all these points of view into account, or most of them anyway, well, what should Canadians start thinking about? Ian, there can be a lot of money involved and a lot of moving parts when it comes to taxes. Canadians who may have to make some big business decisions in the weeks ahead should talk it through with a financial advisor. Nisha Patel in Toronto, thanks. Getting more housing was a big focus of the federal budget for buyers and renters. Rent increases are a concern everywhere. In Ontario, landlords need to apply for certain hikes. Now CBC News has seen data that give a picture of who they are. Sarah McMillan has those details. This apartment has been home for Michael Quadra and his parents for more than two decades. But living here on their tight budget is becoming more challenging. The building owner recently notified the family their rent could be going up more than $65 a month. That's $25 more than they were expecting. With food prices also going up with everything else getting more expensive. That is just more ways that our budget is getting squeezed out of us. This building is rent controlled. Landlords can only raise the rent a certain amount each year. This year it's set at 2.5%. But landlords in Ontario can apply to raise the rent above that guideline in certain cases, including to help cover major capital costs. In Quadra's case, the work at his building included elevator modernization and roof repair. They want to repair something that they neglected and then pass on the charges to us. Tenants and their advocates have organized protests and rent strikes because of above guideline rent increases or AGIs. Now we're learning more about which companies are applying for AGIs most often. CBC analyzed data from the first eight months of 2022 from the Landlord and Tenant Board. There were 470 AGI applications. More than a quarter came from five landlords. Well ahead of the pack was Quadra's landlord, Starlight Investments, which alone accounted for nearly 10%, with 46 applications. Next, there was Realstar with 25, BCIMC, which has properties managed by Quadreal with 22, Homestead with 15, and Hazelview with 14. This lawyer works with low-income clients. She says she's not surprised by the data. They reflect the fact that rental housing is being concentrated in fewer hands and in the hands of financial investors who have the stated and admitted purpose 
of generating a profit and generating a mass maximum profit for their investors. Tenants can dispute AGIs at the Landlord and Tenant Board, but our analysis found most of the applications are approved. We asked for interviews with the top five landlords. None provided interviews, but most provided written statements. Starlight Investments says it only applies for AGIs for essential capital projects and says it works hard to keep residents informed and updated. Three of the other companies said they comply with provincial rules when applying for AGIs, and several directed us to the Federation of Rental Housing Providers of Ontario. The CEO of that group says many large landlords have bought up buildings that require a lot of work. These are really old buildings often, and they do need a lot uh, done to modernize them, to bring them up to a better standard, and so this is one mechanism to help with that. But this housing advocate says it's time to get rid of AGIs. The question is not whether buildings need to be upgraded or maintained. The question is who should be paying uh, for this work. We asked the Ministry of Housing if it's considering any changes to AGI rules and if it's concerned that large corporate landlords are responsible for a significant portion of applications. The ministry did not answer those questions. And Sarah, what's the situation outside Ontario? Well, Ian, it really varies across the country. So not all provinces even have rent control in the first place. In Alberta and Saskatchewan, for example, there's none at all. So landlords in those provinces can raise rents as much as they'd like. But there are guidelines in place in some provinces, including in British Columbia, though there is one important difference in that province. In B.C., costs that arise from poor maintenance of a building are not eligible. And, and you met a lot of people as you were gathering this story. What, what struck you most about it? Well, Ian, you know, there is a lot of advocacy right now around tenants' rights, so certainly above guideline rent increases have been in the news. But I found that understanding all the intricacies isn't really that simple, and it's clear just how much time people like Michael Quadra, who you heard from in my story, are spending trying to learn about the system and to fight rent increases. You know, Michael said that he didn't even know about above guideline increases before this year. Now he's started a tenant union in his building. And he pointed out that many of the people in his building, including his own parents are immigrants to Canada and English is their second language and that makes navigating the system and trying to dispute rent increases even more challenging. Sarah McMillan in our newsroom in Toronto. India's massive population is setting the stage for a massive election. Can't get any bigger. The only thing which can bigger, get bigger is our own election next time. How the high stakes vote is expected to play out. India is holding the world's biggest election, yet beneath this staggering feat of democracy are concerns for its future. There is another worry that has crept in, which is uh, the undermining of institutions. The popular current leader of the country, a target of criticism. Our South Asia correspondent Salima Shivji shows the enormous challenge involved in getting nearly a billion people to the polls. A weekday evening at a busy market in India's capital. And while the focus here is on finding good deals on shirts and shoes, not on casting a ballot, it still gives you a sense of just how many people live here and what it takes to pull off the complicated logistics of the world's biggest election. It's certainly that. There are nearly a billion eligible voters here in India, 968 million to be precise, and getting them to the polls is a mammoth task. Indian election is not only the biggest election in the world, it is the biggest management event of any kind in the world. The logistics are uh, mind-boggling. He would know. That's S.Y. Qureshi, a former head of India's election commission. And he wants to focus on that number, almost a billion voters. That's more than the populations of the U.S., the European Union and Russia combined. India's election officials go door to door in the years between votes to update the country's electoral roll. So reaching out to one billion people, it can't get any bigger. The only thing which can big, get bigger is our own election next time. Uh, five years later, it will be even bigger. So that, that's what it is. At least one million polling stations. 
and 15 million polling agents, many of whom go to extreme lengths to reach every Indian voter, taking boats, choppers, even horses, trekking through mountains deep in the Himalayas and through lion-infested jungles. Sometimes a team travels 70 kilometers to set up a booth for just one person. Meet the Indian man who gets his very own voting booth. A priest and a dedicated voter, with a polling station all to himself for years. Because India's election commission guarantees you can vote within two kilometers of your home. Unfortunately, this guy died last year. <laughs> so we are one uh, polling station less now. <laughs> but the idea is to show that how every vote, uh, every single vote matters. Security also matters, and that's why India's election happens in phases. Seven days of voting spread out over more than six weeks in 543 ridings crisscrossing the entire country. That's so tens of thousands of federal paramilitary troops who are freed up to keep the election safe can travel across a country so big in order to make sure no violence breaks out. As for the politics of it all, there's deep support in many quarters for Narendra Modi, prime minister for the last decade, gunning for a third straight term. His power well entrenched and his popularity unparalleled. I trust Modi, I, I vote Modi. We need Modi because uh, to change our India, like to develop our India, Modi's need. Why do you compare him to because a god? Same qualities he's having. He is selfless, selfless. He works only for the people. But there's also concern about an increasingly less democratic India and that this election is one-sided, especially when it comes to money. Political donations, mostly from large corporations, were unlimited and anonymous ever since Modi's party, the BJP, set up a new system in 2017. But India's Supreme Court recently struck down that arrangement, calling it unconstitutional. Turns out Modi's party received billions of dollars of untraceable money from the scheme, says longtime political scientist Rajiv Vargava. Uh, there is no level playing field at the moment, and the BJP is actually getting uh, uh, about 10 times more than the next you know, uh, political party. But there is another worry that has crept in, which is uh, the undermining of institutions. The media, the judiciary, it's a slide towards a more autocratic India, he says, in a country fiercely proud of its title as the world's largest democracy, where voter turnout is usually very high. A massive democratic process that has no parallel, with weeks of voting, but all of those millions of votes counted and released all in one day, June 4th. The battle for democracy may be priceless, but we do have an idea of what India's election will cost. About 20 billion Canadian dollars, more than double what it was in 2019. Coming up, a surfer takes aim at the history books by tackling one of the biggest waves ever measured. We haven't ever surfed these kind of conditions. The water is really uncontrollable. The ride of a lifetime is next in our moment. It's a breathtaking wave there off the coast of Nazare, Portugal. And if you look closely, you'll see Sebastian Steutner, a German surfer who decided to take it on. Steutner already broke the record for riding the tallest wave three years ago, set at that same Portuguese location. Tonight, his attempt to up the ante is our moment. The ocean was very angry and very powerful. It was very intense. We've waited for, I think, three or four years to have those kind of wave conditions and years of preparation and developing new technology, changing the, the shape of the surfboard, changing our mindset. Still going, still going. We track the storms and we can kind of see maybe seven days out um, that there is a big storm in the, in, the, in the Atlantic. 24 hours before the waves arrive, we, we can give the green light. We haven't ever surfed these kind of conditions. I'm very scared in the lead up and in the preparation. The water is really uncontrollable, but it, it's very enjoyable for me. I have zero fear in the moment and it's just uh, letting go of everything and just charging into the wave. It's a surreal feeling. It shows me how insignificant, how small, how, how unimportant we are compared to nature. 
I know nothing about surfing, but th those kinds of videos are mesmerizing. And uh, and again, as I'm kind of reading up, learning on about this, um, how big that wave is, whether in fact it is a record, is not an easy thing to determine. And so whether he set a record, he says may take months as they deal with the metrics of it, trying to make sure that the measurement that they've come up with with drones is in fact verifiable. Thank you for being with us. You can watch anywhere, anytime on the free CBC News app and subscribe to The National's YouTube channel. I hope you join me Sunday for Cross Country Checkup and The National. I'm Ian Panamancy in Vancouver.